Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, tonight, we are going to finish up Module 2. Uh, the goal is to familiarize you with the Technology Integration Matrix, otherwise known as TIM, uh, and specifically the TIM-O. Don't you love these acronyms? The TIM-O, which is the Technology Integration Matrix Observation. And we're going to be using that then to look at those uh, examples of the videos in our uh, little wiki space that I have created. And then we're going to look at universal design for learning. Again, the whole point of this is by the time we're finished, you will be creating a blend space that will showcase the videos. It could be one, could be two, could be three um, that showcase TPAC, TIM, and UDL. Now, I've had questions uh, last week about could I find one that violates the ideas of TPAC, TIM, and UDL? You certainly can. Although with TIM, pretty much the violations are built into it. So in other words, if you find a video that just doesn't have any kind of technology integration in it, yes, you can find those and you can point that out in um, the video you pick but you must do it through the lens of Tim. And I'll show you what I mean here in just a second. UDL is universal design for learning. It is creating pathways in for, for a few to the benefit of all. And so what we'd be looking for with, TIM, with the UDL is, is the technology used in the classroom something that benefits all kids to be able to uh, enjoy and to interact with the curriculum. And we're doing all this using something called a blend space. And I'll show you how blend space works again. But before we get going, I've had a couple of questions about what do we do about our um, stuff that we have created so far. So let me give you an idea of how the live text works. And I'm going to pop out of this module because that's the one for tonight. Let's go back and look at our our first module that we did with our full and book studies. And I'm going to make sure here I don't accidentally wipe out <laughs> our class. So I'm going to jump into here and let's go find the first one. You know, I've always uh, have apologized to everybody. There is no way to organize live text. So it has some kind of numerical order, like, you know, one, two, three, four. It's just all over the place like this. And I can't find anything in the live text that tells you how to do that. So I apologize for it, I guess is what I'm saying to you. So let's go into module one. This is the one we've been doing before last week. And as you can see, when I go into, now mine's going to look different than yours, but don't panic. It all works. I'm going to be going in here. And as you can see here, it basically is the same language that was in the Blackboard. And it says, paste your infographic links here. Let me show you how to do that. It's very simple. So if I come back up here, and here's Marks. And if I just double click on Marks, what's going to happen is it will open it up into uh, the Padlet, and that way I can get I can get an URL off of it. That's one way that I can do it. Okay, in other words, I can expand the post by clicking on the little snowman, and when I do that, as you can see, it lets me see View Original. And then from here, there's the link. Now I can do it that way, or I can just go back in to uh, pick the chart, the infographics, find it there. Either way, I will get this URL. Then all I'm going to do is copy that URL. I'm going to come into here. I'm going to click on the little pencil that says Edit. And that basically means now this thing is an editable uh, document. 
I'm going to come down below where it says paste your infographic links here and I'm going to paste it. Now, I know that in the past I used to have people come in and use this little icon right here that says link. And I have had people paste in their link here and then say OK. Now the problem is sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. As you can see here it kind of worked. We think. That's, that's always been the problem. So I'm going to do a save and finish. And it worked. So it will work if you want to go through all of that. What I'm trying to get you to understand is I understand that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So for Mark to have put this in as his link this way, all I do is I come in and highlight it, right click on it and go to the link and it takes me there. So what I'm trying to get you to realize is you don't need to panic over how to get your link into um, live text. If you just want to copy it in, fine. Now realize, of course, for this first module, you have two links. You have the chapter two and three and chapter four and five. The point is, don't work yourself up. Just get it in there. Now, if you want to put it into where it's a live link, go up there and click on the, click on the little chain icon, paste it in, save it. Fully realizing that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. We don't know why, but there we are. All right. So that helps us see what we're doing with live text, I hope. So let me back out of here and let's jump back down here. So last week we started with our old friend, the TPAC. TPAC stands for Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge. TPAC is all about the work done by Schulman uh, in looking at how good teachers incorporate pedagogy into the teaching of their content. Good teachers understand that pedagogy uh, can change due to the context of how you're teaching or what you're teaching. That the trick is that change happens because of the need that we might have for understanding better or introducing the content to students. So the pedagogy of lecture may be necessary at the beginning of teaching because kids have to understand the new words and they have to understand the new concepts. But then we do a nice pedagogical slide over into collaborative work or deep inquiry kind of work or research work. We slide into another pedagogy so that the learning can be much richer, much deeper than just taking it in and vomiting back. Now, where does T fit into all this? Well, we said last week that when you were making those considerations about how you're going to teach, T should be the last, unless you're in a class that's focused on T. In other words, you're teaching a lab. So the technology comes in as a support tool for the Schulman pedagogical dance or pedagogical slide. So it may not be present all the time. In other words, kids might just use the technology as a way of doing research or kids might use the technology to create something that demonstrates understanding. So Google Classroom, use of Google Slides, help me understand how you see uh, the run up to the First World War. Create a Google Slides, six slides, et cetera, et cetera. You know all that stuff. So, but the technology never comes first. We're always focused on the interplay between content and pedagogy, and the technology is another tool that allows us to have meaning or demonstrate meaning by students.
Let's look at Tim. So when you look at Tim, let me turn off the, when you look at Tim, one of the things that you are struck by is it is a very much a hands-on kind of tool. One of the things about TPAC, and let me see if I have it in here so I can show it to you. Um, I used to make people do this. I don't make people do it anymore, but let me give you an idea of what it looks like. So this is the TPAC rubric, okay? Pretty straightforward rubric. So here are the criteria, curriculum goals and technology, instructional strategies and technologies, technology standards fit. And then when you go across it, you can see that the high score is technology select for use in the instructional plan are strongly aligned with more curricular goals. Uh, technology use optimally supports instructional strategies. Technology selections are exemplary given curriculum goals and instructional strategies. And then for fit, content, instructional strategy, and technology fit together strongly within the instructional plan. This has been highly criticized because it just really doesn't have enough, I don't know if you want to say meat on the bone, structure. There's just a lot here that kind of is open for criticism about it. When you look at something like Tim, Tim is very much like other tools that we have used in the past looking at technology integration. Some of those tools were LODI, L-O-T-I, Levels of Technology Integration. Uh, LODI came out of, I don't know if it came out of the University of Tennessee. No, it came out of the University of Memphis in Tennessee. Um, it was a tool that was supposed to drive uh, PD. So Lodi was not necessarily an observational tool. In other words, you didn't walk into somebody's class and do a Lodi. Lodi was a self-reporting tool that teachers did, and then they were asked to be very honest about their levels of understanding of the various different tools um, that were employed in the use of technology. When we used to, and we used to use Lodi, and when we would train about Lodi, what we would say to principals and teachers was this was not an evaluative tool. In other words, you don't go in and take the Lodi and then come back and say, well, Mrs. Smith, you didn't score very well on your Lodi. No, never was supposed to intended to be like that. It was supposed to be a self-reporting tool that then helped the principal understand what technology professional development needs he or she had in the building. Along came another tool called SAMR, substitution, uh, augmentation, modification, and redefinition, S-A-M-R, SAMR. Now, again, that kind of harkened back to the TPAC kind of way of looking at things. So substitution was you're using technology as a substitute for something else. So word processing is a substitute for paper pencil. Augmentation, you're using word processing, but because of the abilities that it has for, for doing other things, you then suddenly have the ability for, say, in Google Docs, collaboration on a doc, or in Word, you know, commenting. Uh, modification, you're taking the idea of a word process document, and you're redefining it to become more interesting, if I can use such a term, but broader in the way that it brings in its information. Obviously, you bring in hot links, you bring in graphics, you bring in, um, and in fact, you can take the whole word processing idea and turn it over into, say, a Google Slides or a PowerPoint. And then modification is you basically, I mean, redefinition, excuse me, in redefinition, you basically take the idea of word processing and you turn it on its head. So word processing may not look like words on paper or words on screen. It may look like an oral presentation. It may look like a video presentation. It doesn't necessarily have to follow the guidelines of what we think of when we think of word processing. So SAMR, again, was a tool that basically 
gave you a way of this sort of global look at how technology was to be used in a school. Um, there have been um, reports of it being used in schools in Jefferson County. Again, the problem with SAMR is it's, it's very, very wide. And I could see a school where the faculty would gather together and say, well, we're not going to be just a substitution school. We're going to be a M school. We're going to modify things so that it is more engaging and, and a wider chance for kids to participate, which is a UDL concept. Um, the problem with it is what we've seen from the research done with TPAC is that is all related to context. So saying that you're going to do it throughout the school day, throughout the school year, sometimes you may not need to be that. You may just need to be a substitution. Or there may be opportunities where you really should think about how can we redefine the technology use in this particular aspect. And that gets us to Tim. Tim comes from the excellent sources um, in Florida. Florida has some of the best uh, technology integration tools that are out there. And the Tim is very much a part of that. It is a paid package. You can't go out and just grab it. Although, as you can see, I have. Uh, it's created by the Florida Center for Instructional Technology, University of South Florida. USF is a big name in technology instruction. It is a really nice tool. What I'm going to do is let me come down here to this PDF that I have so I can make it bigger. I hope you see it better. Now, I hope you can see this. I hope it's coming through. Um, you go across the top and you're looking for levels of technology integration. You go down the side and you're looking at how the characteristics of the learning environment, what are they? And then you go across the top and find then how that fits with these different integration levels. Well, the integration levels are entry level. Let me blow this up a little bit for you. Here we go. So the integration level, the entry, entry level, the teacher is just beginning to use technology tools to deliver curriculum content to students. PowerPoints, websites, Adoption level, the teacher directs students in the conventional and procedural use of technology tools. In other words, how to use certain tools to complete the task in the classroom. The adoption level is the teacher facilitates students in exploring and independently using technology tools. So in, in that environment, kids are basically given tasks to do where they have an understanding of the various tools that are available to them, and therefore they go and use them. And then in the infusion, the teacher provides the learning context and students choose the technology tools to achieve the outcome. And so as you can see here, in the adaption level, what's happening is the teacher is showing them the tools. This would be a good tool for us to figure out blah, blah, blah. In the infusion level, it's just part of the curriculum. It's just part of the teaching uh, day, part of the, how the room works. And then you come down here. And you can see that these various characteristics then are active learning, collaborative learning, constructivist learning, authentic learning, and goal-directed learning. So then when you go across here, when you look at that, when you see active learning, information is passively received, um, active adoption, conventional procedural use of tools, active adaption, conventional independent use of tools, some student choice and exploration, and then under the infusion, Choice of tools and regular self-directed. Again, think about a Google Classroom setup and how this and this and this could be accomplished. Now, under collaborative learning, again, 
you see here that students use technology tools, collaborate with each other rather than working individually. And in that entry level, we see individual students using the tools. Collaboration adoption, we see there's starting to be students working together. Collaborative adaption, collaborative use of tools. Some students choose choice and exploration. And then finally, under infusion. I, um, classic example of this is I was at uh, a middle school about a month ago now, and I was in a Project Lead the Way class. And the thing that I found so exciting was every kid in the room had their own Chromebook. And when we basically set up an idea um, and then the teacher said, OK, now here are the tools that we can use. But if you know of other tools, feel free. And then she let the kids loose. Um, they worked for about 15 minutes and then she brought them back. I was kind of chuckling to myself because of the Larry Rosen video that we watched about that 15 minute thing. Um, when they came back then, it was really fascinating to see all the different ways that kids had gone and used the different tools at their disposal. Of course, with the Chrome based uh, OS, you can do that because all these extensions that are cooked into the Chrome made it really easy for them to do. Constructivist learning or constructive learning, um, Students use technology tools to connect new information to their prior knowledge. This is a classic example uh, definition of constructivism. Uh, I maintain constructivism is not a theory. It's a reality. Uh, we do constructivist thinking and learning all the time, in school, out of school, going to the grocery store. Um, I'll give you an example of the grocery store kind of thing. When we went to the grocery store for the first time and picked up one of those scanners that they have now at Kroger. So our understanding of how it worked was based upon understanding how to use our phone, how to scan things like QR codes, et cetera, et cetera. And then we went to use it with the various things that we were buying at the grocery. We had to understand that when you press that button, there's a little light that shows up and you have to get it right in the middle of where the scan code is before it goes clink. And then you, you have put that into your Kroger list. So when you look at that, you can see here under constructive entry, students' information is just given to people. Here's your scanner. Point it at that thing and press this button. Look at constructive adoption, guided conventional use for bu building knowledge. In that, what we were basically doing is, OK, so this thing works this way. What do I know? What have I experienced before? It helps me understand that. And we do not passively do that in class. We actively do that in class. Then under constructive adaptation, you have kids doing independent use for building knowledge. And there's some student choice and expression. In that one, what we hope happens is that there is independent use for building knowledge. Again, if we haven't cooked into the class the understanding of that constructivism is all about looking at your prior knowledge, looking at the new knowledge, how is the best fit? If we don't have practice with that, you have a really hard time getting to constructive adaptation. And finally, when it comes to infusion, choice and regular use for building knowledge, you know, that's in that one, our problem with that one is kids have been so well trained to what's the right answer teacher that this one's a little this one's hard to see but boy when you see it it's something to to really sit back and smile about so constructivist learning is new learning that we can look at old learning and see best fit and then technology how it best fits for our demonstration of understanding authentic learning you know, students use technology tools to link learning activities to the world. Um, authentic entry, use unrelated to the world outside of the instructional setting. This is that classic, here's a website, let's all look at it. Then the, the adoption is, and this can be like a web quest, uh, which is old tech, frankly, these days, but they're still out there. And all it is is basically you ask kids, Here's, here's the thing I want you to do. Um, use this list of websites to go and find the information. 
fill in the blanks. Under adaptation, now what you're doing is you're allowing kids to do independent use, trying to help them see how they can find the information and the activities in there connected to their understanding their lives. And then finally, infusion, kids are picking the tools and they're then in regular use in meaningful activities. You know, this is it's high, high flying language here, but let's, let's get it down to earth a little bit. If I give kids a new idea in say science, social studies, and I want to claim that I have authentic infusion going on in my authentic learning, then kids are going to naturally go and pull up the Google. Now, what they will then understand because of prior teaching is primary sources, secondary sources. So if I'm using Google to find information about a social studies activity or anything, I need to understand about that primary source, secondary source stuff. And I need to understand where I have to go to find that. Now, to me, when you see that in authentic infusion, that kids are, are realizing, okay, so this is a secondary source. Read, 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 read. Oh, here's a, here's a source that says it came from here. Go to that source. That, to me, is when you're seeing the authentic learning take place. And then when the student reports out, either through presentations, slides, PowerPoint, Word document, uh, docs, they're making those connections. This is how I see this fits into my understanding and into my world. And then the last one we want to look at is goal-directed learning. Students use technology tools to set goals, plan activities, monitor progress, and evaluate results rather than simply completing assignments without reflection. Directions given step by test, test, Directions given, step-by-step -step task monitoring. This is the part about Google Classroom that worries me, because it's very easy to set that up. Um, and if we go back to our TPAC understandings, and we go back to that context, there may be need for that kind of context, that kind of focus, goal-directed entry. Because... If we show kids how something gets done, and then they do a demonstration of it, then we've moved to goal-directed adoption. And then we come back and we give them a task where then they have to do adaptation to then complete the task to understand why am I using this tool and how is it helping with the task that I'm on? And then under infusion, we have the flexible and seamless uses of tools to plan and monitor. So when we look at Tim, we are looking across the top here. These are sort of your boxes of what you're looking for. And then down through here are your categories of the characteristics that you're looking for for how the, the TIM is used. Now, there is a there is a TIM document that we're not going to do um, because it really requires you spending some serious quality time in a classroom. But it's a really interesting one because what it will do is you go in and you do observations of kids, but you also do observations of teachers. So in other words, what are, what are teachers doing while the lesson is going on with technology? And what are the kids doing while the lesson is going on with technology? And you could probably see how you could do that with just this simple uh, one I have here. You could just color code things. So in other words, you could say the teacher um, activity will be, we'll color it red and the kids will be blue. And you could go here and you could say, okay, for the active learning, what I'm seeing is that the teacher is doing um, one of these and then the kids are doing one of these. You know, you, you could do it. But it does give you a nice overall picture. But for our purposes, 
we're looking at the Tim, we're looking at these videos that are in here, and we're looking for examples, good or bad, of the Tim. All righty, that was Tim. Uh, let's see, what else do I need to show you about Tim? There, I have some other things in here uh, about the Tim. Here's a nice little Tim explanation um, that is a PowerPoint. You know how I feel about PowerPoints. So, but if you want to have further understanding, it's right there. I think I've given you a pretty good idea of how it works. If you want to see in more depth about this, if you click on this one, the interactive tool, um, what it can do is you can click on it and it does a better job or not does a better job. It goes into more deeply what each one of these characteristics means. Um, it's a nice, it's a nice deep dive into the whole idea. Okay. And you'll notice it has some videos in it. So if you need to see that, you know, in other words, you need to actually see what it means. Here you go. Um, let me, let me do this real fast. Let's go over here and pick one and let's do inf uh, infusion. And let's look at that. monument that they would like to do research on. I did go through a whole group lesson first, so I went through step by step what to do with them, including how to create a photo story, also including how to go to the websites and to look for their research information. But pretty much they went on their own. They were able to go back and edit and change recording voices. And um, I feel like that's important because it is real world to, to apply what they're doing in the classroom. Okay. You get the idea. All right. That's Tim. I think Tim is very straightforward. Um, and when you look at it within the framework of the assignment, that, again, you have that nice broad canvas there that you can work with. Just make sure that when you put it together, you're defining what you see in the video through that lens of Tim. All right, let's go look at UDL. UDL is, to me, again, one of these things that is not necessarily a theory as much as it is a reality. Universal Design for Learning is a really interesting idea. Uh, one of the things I would challenge you to do, because it's fun, is go in here and do learning styles test. Um, this is based upon the work of Howard Gardner, and it is a really, oh, it stopped, okay. It was based upon on his ideas about the different ways that people show intelligence. Um, and what's really funny about the whole Gardner thing it was very, 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 very hot uh, about 10 to 15 years ago. And so you would have people, you know, like some people, uh, the old joke is, are you a Capricorn or are you a Sagittarian? Well, people then started going around saying, um, I'm a kinesthetic learner. I'm a visual learner. I'm an auditory learner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what was funny was, when you talk to the people at Harvard, the students at Harvard who took his classes, and I actually did go, go there and see all this, um, the thing that they said was that he was the worst teacher they ever had because all he did was lecture all day long. And they never got to, they never got to use their different ways of um, understanding. Let me see if I can put this together for you in a way 
that, uh, well, I, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. And I will just go through bits and pieces of this so that you can understand it. What we're trying to do is UDL grew out of the IDEA law, Individuals with Disabilities Act back in 1997. And originally what it was about was giving access to people. Um, you know, if you ever wondered where all of the cuts and sidewalks that have the little bumpy things on them so as you can go up and down them with a wheelchair. That's where it came from. <clears throat> if you've ever wondered about why do we now have ramps it's in uh, uh, schools uh, and like universities, why do we have automatic doors? That's why. And the idea was that we were creating barriers for people and we weren't, they weren't able to come in and participate in all the activities that we normally think about. Um, I remember the first thing that crossed my mind when I looked at the condo that I presently own in Gulf Shores, Alabama, was when we walked in, the first thing you noticed was how wide the doorways were. And that was in all doorways and in the hallways. That building that, that my place is located in was built for accommodations of people in wheelchairs and walkers. Um, that's not to say that everybody in the, in the place is in a wheelchair or a walker, but it, it's to say that when you have that kind of thinking that goes in before the thing is built, it's just a natural extension of the place, and you don't even think about it until somebody points it out. You know, I've had people stay with me, and they go, boy, the door's in your condo are very, very wide. Oh, and there's a little, makes it very easy for you to get out the sliding doors onto the balcony. Again, UDL, UDL is all about making adaptations that help some to the benefit of all. Consider the needs of the broadest possible range of users from the beginning. So that was its its beginning. It was very much an idea that fit into creating places and places for people to go to that was accessible. But then these were the ideas that started to take root. Not one size fits all, but alternatives. Designed from the beginning, not added on later. Increases access opportunities for everyone. Another example. Next time you're in the grocery store. Next time you're in the Home Depot. Look at those cards that are up there that tell you what's in the aisles. Now, being somebody who's visually impaired, I've noticed this, and I actually ask. Uh, the Kroger near me in Stony Brook, they, were, um, they redid it. And I was in the store one day and there was a guy walking around with his little clipboards from, you know, home office. And I said something to him about, have you all deliberately made the signs that tell you what's in the aisles bigger? He said, yes, we have. And I said, may I ask why? He said, well, because America's graying and we need it to have signs that as people get older and their sight gets poorer, they can. See. So there you go. So there's an excellent example of UDL in action. Here's this. One guy with his limited vision who is getting a benefit from the fact that signs are made nice and big now. Oh, actually lower too, if you've noticed that. Um, but it's a benefit to everyone. Uh, when you go into airports now, it used to be when you went into airports, you had to read your flight info and out in, in coming and outgoing information on these little, not little, but these 27 inch monitors mounted up in the ceilings. Good eye test there. You could read them. Now they're on LCD panels that are mounted more at eye level. 
Again, universal design at play. Now, the folks who are all about universal design for learning are the folks that are at CAST. Um, CAST is an organization that is all about uh, applying special technologies. That's the ST, Center for Applied Special Technologies. So they have been involved in this whole idea they weren't going in as people who were designing cutouts and ramps and things like that. They wanted to look at what happens to barriers in learning. And so David Rose, who is a cognitive scientist, made this simple statement. Cass believes that, learner, that barriers to learning are not in fact inherent in the capacities of learners. Underline, underline, underline but instead arise in learners' interactions with inflexible educational goals, materials, methods, and assessments. Let that sit for a while. The picture on the left here is looking more and more like our schools today. And how do we allow for everyone to have access to the curriculum. Now, let me take a big step back here. I am not talking about differentiated instruction here. I'll be quite upfront, honest with you. I think differentiated instruction has been oversold. Uh, how in the world you do it in a room full of 28 people? I have no idea. But I do understand how UDL works. And I think looking at this definition that UDL is an educational approach to learning, teaching, and assessment, drawing on new brain research and new media technologies to respond to individual learner differences. Again, UDL is about making pathways in for a few who need them to access the curriculum to the benefit of all. Let me tell you a quick UDL story. I have a dear friend, brother from another mother, who is a child with Down syndrome. Um, and this uh, guy, young man, was always placed in the least restrictive environment when he was in elementary school, middle school, and high school. He had to be assigned to an, a special ed class because that's how special ed works in Jefferson County. You have to have a special ed label on you for the county to receive funds, et cetera, et cetera. And they wonder why they're in trouble. But anyway, so when he was in high school, he expressed a desire to take an AP American history class. Now, the AP teacher was a good guy and he basically said what I'm worried about is the level of instruction in here is very high because you're basically preparing the kids for the AP American history test so the question was asked could this student my friend's son could he participate in the class and instead of the AP final he would create a video that would demonstrate his understanding of some aspect of American history. The teacher said, and would I be allowed to grade it at the same level? In other words, would I be able to, to grade it as close to what the expectations would be for the people who were taking the AP test? And everybody said, sure. Now think about that for a second. What we're saying there is, could he read? Yes, he could read. Could he write? Yes, although his handwriting was horrible, but he could type. So he had ways of demonstrating. What he was wanting to do was to show his understandings other than a 20-page research paper, which was the final assessment before they took the AP test. 
the teacher gave him the go ahead and do that. Now, the paper was built around the idea that you took this piece, this part of American history from uh, the beginning of the First World War to present, and you basically researched it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Made sure you did the right things with footnotes and uh, all of that. Well, David did it using an iMovie. And what he did with the iMovie is he went in and he researched music because he loves music. And he went in and researched music that was representative of what was happening in the country. And he then went and he researched why that music was that way. So when he came to the part in his video where he was explaining what jazz was and where jazz came from and where it fit in this timeline, He had a few slides with text. What he mostly had was him explaining it. And his voice was definitely, you had to learn to listen to it, but it wasn't impossible to. It certainly wasn't gibberish. It was very clear, and you just had to listen carefully to him. And he turned that in. And received an A. Now, he also took the AP test, by the way, and did okay. Didn't do enough that would have given him the credit hours to go to school on, but he did okay. My point to that is this. So when you look at this UDL definition, it's an educational approach to teaching, learning, and assessment, drawing on new brain research and new media technologies to respond to individual learning differences. Well, let's go look at that new brain research real fast here. So this is Dr. Rose's research. As I said, he's not an educator. He is a neurologist who, when the whole idea of being able to see brains for the first time, MRNs and all of that, got very excited about what they were seeing. And when he did that, he found that our brains are made up of three different kinds of networks. You have the recognition network, the strategic network, and the affective network. And when you look at these different parts, this is, when we understand this, then we start to understand where the holes are, where the gaps are in student learning. And so you can see here that recognition networks are the what of learning. They identify, interpret patterns of sound, light, taste, touch, and smell. Write everything down you see. And then we go to this picture here. And so what you're supposed to do is this. And you're putting down everything you see, and you only get six seconds to look at it. Bang. Now, when you think about what I just did, first of all, I didn't set you up. <laughs> Actually, I did set you up. I set you up because I didn't tell you you're going to get six seconds. But what I did is I showed you a picture. Here, let's look at it. And looking at this picture, you are going to report back different information depending upon your previous knowledge base. And if you have a very poor experiential knowledge base, and you see this all the time with kids learning letter sounds, uh, kindergartners. So when you start saying things like, what does the cow say? The cow says, and some kid will bark like a dog or meow like a cat. Never seen a cow. They never heard a cow. Now that sounds far-fetched and it sounds, oh, really, Steve? That's silly. No, it's not silly. I've seen it too many times. And then we think, well, there's something wrong with that kid. What is wrong with that kid? He doesn't know how a cow sounds. He must be cow disabled. No, he hasn't had the experiences of hearing cows, of having someone sit down with him and reading the book that has cows in it that they make the moo sound. He hasn't had the experience of singing along to the old lady who swallowed the fly. He hasn't had those experiences that 
we take for granted that everybody has. When I used to work with people with severe disabilities, one of the things that I would tell my student teachers was, it's all going in. It's all going in. So what we have to do is we have to realize that most people with severe disabilities or even moderate disabilities have led fairly sheltered lives, either out of some kind of protectiveness, laziness. Well, I don't have to read to that kid. He won't understand what I'm saying to him. But it's all going in. It's all going in. So when we look at strategic networks and we look at UDL, what we have to think about is, do we have other ways for kids to have understandings that help them see what the new understandings might be? And we can do that in lots of different ways with technology. So in technology, you basically can give kids the ability to watch something that sort of fills in the gaps. You can have in your Google Classroom a material in there that's made up of series of videos that will help kids see the connections to what you're trying to teach. And then here's where the UDL really shows off. So you have in your Google Classroom this series of videos that are all about understanding linear equations. And they're really well done and they're very clear. So if kids who have had understandings before, but they're not really sure, they have access to them. The kid who comes in who is, has no prior explanation, no prior knowledge, or if that prior knowledge was poorly done, poorly learned, they have the opportunity to really catch up. Now, that means we have the responsibility to find good stuff. And as you'll see when we get into module three, that, that's, that's a challenge. So that's the first area of our brains. And by the way, look where it's located. Isn't that interesting? Now let's go to the strategic. So these are the strategic networks are the how of learning. They plan, execute, monitor actions and skills. What historical period and geographical location do you think this picture represents? And then we look at our picture again. How do you now apply strategies to understanding that? Well, if you've had a background in history, you can look at this and you can look at the lady holding the door open and you go, huh, she's dressed like a maid. The man has come in and he's wearing an overcoat. And the lady is wearing a very long dress. So strategically, I can kind of look at that and think, maybe this has to do with an older time. I can go up here and look at the light that's mounted on the wall back here. And if I look at it really closely, I can make a guess as to maybe that's gas or electric or kerosene even. And so I can make some ideas, but let me give you a bigger picture of this. Strategic networks are the ones that drive us crazy as teachers. And you hear it all the time. If the kid would just get organized. <laughs> um, you know, as a, as a parent, uh, I was blessed with two very, very bright children. One of them was what we would call a messy learner. And you'd go into his room and everything was a mess. The other was what I call a bentu learner. Do you know what I mean by bentu box? Bentu boxes are the boxes um, in Japan when you order your lunch. It comes to you in a little box with different uh, places in it for your sushi and your rice and so on. So I, my daughter was a bentu learner. She, everything was in its place and everything had organization to it. 
And the interesting thing was the messy guy would moan and groan about taking tests and he would walk in and he'd ace them every time. He aced the ACT. But yet, if you were to look at him, or not look at him, he was not a, a messy person. <laughs> if you looked at the way he organized himself, he would say, how in the world does this guy ever learn anything? And my Bintu learner, she had a really difficult time with tests. But she could get it organized enough that when she went in, she did well. One of the things that we have to realize is there are people sitting in our classrooms who are messy learners. And we have to understand how to help them organize themselves so that they can have interactions with the content. You see this all the time. You see this all the time. You'll have something in class and you'll say to people, okay, let's get our pencil and papers out. And three quarters of your class has to put, the other quarter of the class is still digging through uh, the desk or still digging in backpacks trying to find, I don't have a pencil. Uh, do you have paper? You know, you, you, those are those kind of kids that drive you nuts. What we're saying is having the ability to have an open area in the classroom, pencils, paper, the things that they need, and then making that a part of the culture of the classroom. Need paper, pencil? Here it is. You know, you only have to do that a couple of times. That helps kids with strategies to approach the curriculum. Now, there are a ton more strategies. You know that, and I know that. So if we help people, I watched a guy, uh, I K-tipped a guy at Wagner High School last year. LD math teacher. And the thing I was so blown away by him was all the different strategies that he taught his kids so they could understand higher level mathematics. And we're talking here slope and quadratics. We're not talking here one, two, three plus one, two, three. But because of his amazing ability to come up with different strategies that were based upon kids experiences you see how all this kind of starts to fit they were able to do that kind of work and then they were able then to enunciate why they did it the way they did it because they had a new set of strategies that they could fall back on to explain their thinking and as he worked with them in the classroom one of the things he always said and did with them was now, why did you do it that way? What was your strategy? That was his key phrase. And of course, the kid then understood when he said strategy, he's talking about that step, 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 step thing he has showed me. And going on from there, the effective networks, the why of learning, evaluate and set priorities. So, what this is about is how do I engage? How do I engage? Now, unfortunately, this part of your brain is located in that brainstem part, the lizard brain part of us all, that fight or flight part. And you see this all the time as well. If kids have a sense of self-worth and self-purpose in a classroom and they are presented with something that's difficult and then they're presented with here's some information that might help you understand it it's in our Google classroom take the time to go look at it here's a strategy you can use and I respect you needing to have the time to, to understand that those three things, because when you see the other side of it, you see the head down, and then in high school, that's the unwritten rule. You keep your head down, I won't bother you. You see the other side of that, 
kids kick over the chair, kids act out. They're acting out because they have no clue about what the hell's going on in the class. Fight or flight comes in. Now, that's a really oversimplification, and I'm sorry. But I've seen in the 40-some-odd years that I've been doing this, and I have worked with the best of the best, and I have worked with adjudicated youth, kids who have been in the system for crimes. And I'm here to tell you, in both settings, fight or flight is present. Now, in, in kids who are fairly sophisticated, their fight or flight is sophisticated. <laughs> uh, I don't know what we're doing. Make a joke. Or, hey, after school, can we get together and you explain all this to me? Or, I'm not doing this. And the book goes flying across the room. Seen it all. But no matter the school I've been in, you see this. So universal design for learning basically says that these three parts of the brain work together for learning to take place. So we must recognize information, ideas, and concepts and how it fits into previous information. And if that previous information is not there, either from uh, lack of experience, poor teaching, inattentiveness, I'm not letting the kid off the hook here, then this first part is going to be very difficult to do. If we can have strategies as a part of how we do things and we implement them into our classrooms so that these Messy kids don't have to be messy because we have strategies to help them. And then finally, we have a classroom that is respectful and engaging. Now, I don't know about you, but technology fits into every one of these very, very simply. Very, very simply. And that's David's point. That's Dr. Rose's point is what he's saying is, and I've seen this, by the way. Let's go back to the guy that was teaching um, slope and quadratics to that LD class. So what did he use? Well, he used Desmos. Why did he use Desmos? Because it was a very simple, easy, online calculator to use. What were the strategies? He showed them how to enter data into their Desmos to then get the pieces of information they needed then to solve the problems. He talked them through and he made sure they understood what rise over run means. He made sure they understood the language. Then he showed them the strategies and he employed the Desmos. And then he gave them the opportunity to demonstrate their skills and understanding. Oh, and they posted it into Google Classroom. Every kid had a Chromebook. And don't kid yourself. That's coming. It's coming very, very quickly. And as educators, we have to be ready to see it and ready to understand how it affects our students. And the beauty of something like that is in the past when we have tried to do this kind of thing, We've had rather clumsy tools to control things like browsers and so on. With a Chromebook, it's pretty straightforward, easy how to do. And if you have a Chrome extension you want to use with your kids, it's pretty simple to have your Chrome administrator in a building added into the uh, software. One of the things that I still do for JCPS is they will send me an email about there's been a request for this particular piece of software, blah, 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 for use uh, through a Chrome browser. In other words, it's not necessarily a standalone software. It's usually a, a web app. 
and they'll ask me, have you had any experience with that? And then I write back about, yes, I used it with this, this, and this, and this, you know, you all see them, <laughs> you see them in what we're doing in this class. And, you know, then they'll, and I'll ask them, so who's using it and what do they want to use it for? And they come back to me and they say, well, based upon what you're saying, we're going to go ahead and let them have access to it through their Chromebooks. All right. Let's look at Remember Vygotsky? Good old Vygotsky. So he's the guy that told us all about the zones. The zone of proximal development. So if we have a task that's too difficult too difficult for the learner, and the task is too easy for the learner. What we're trying to shoot through or shoot to is that challenge zone. I was teaching a, a group of uh, sophomores today, uh, people who think they want to be a teacher, but they haven't done anything yet. And uh, one of the things that this lady who was in the class, we were doing Google Classroom. I was teaching them how to do Google Classroom. And one of the things the lady in the classroom, she raised her hand and she said, have I got this right? And I asked her, I said, so where are you right now? Are you at a level where you feel very frustrated, where you feel challenged, or this is too easy? And I asked them that all through the, the instruction. I say, on a scale of one to five, show me with your hands. Uh, one meaning I'm lost, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, and five meaning shut up, let me get to work. You know, and you saw all over the room, you saw people threes, fours, and fives, which is what I expected, or hope to see. No ones, no twos threes, fours, and fives. Now the threes indicate to me that it's a challenge. There's something about what we're doing that you just need a little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a, well, can you do this? Uh, a young lady who uh, was trying to create a topic, and if you know Google Classroom, you know what I mean. She was trying to create a topic, and then the idea was within the topic then they were supposed to populate it with stuff. She couldn't get her topic made. And when I walked over and stood behind her, and looked down at what she was doing, I said to her, you haven't logged in. You're just playing on the Google Classroom. And she just went, oh my God, I didn't hear that. Okay, I don't need to, what in the world is wrong with you? Why didn't you hear that? Can't you understand? No, log in, go to classwork, create topic. Got it? Yes, how about everything else? Oh, I got the rest of it, fine, walk away. And of course, I also told them that in education, we got to get off this cheating bit. We have to realize that in the real world, it's not called cheating, it's called collaboration. And so if you're sitting next to somebody who seems to know what the heck they're doing, ask. You know, ask three than me as the teacher. Ask your fellow classmates. Let's have conversation. Picture says it all. We all learned how to ride a bike. We all had somebody hold us up while we first started doing it, and then they let us go. And we wobbled and wibbled and fell down. And then somebody came running over to us and said, You got to keep pedaling. You got to keep pedaling. Finally. Universal design for learning, very simple. All learners are unique, and universal does not mean one size fits all. And all we're asking folks to think about is when we design instruction, especially instruction that has the ability for technology to have an impact on the universal design for learning, then we have a way to help people become a part of the learning process in the curriculum. Benefit to some, benefit to all. All right, so let's go and look at the blend space one more time. And 
since I have no one here with me. I've been alone all this sitting in this room, by the way. It's kind of kind of scary. I've just been talking to an empty, dark room. Let's go in and look at the assignment. Make sure we understand it. So we're going out to the blend space. And in the blend space, we're going to then be using the videos that are located in this wiki right here. The wiki TPAC uh, CEHD. And what we're doing is we're going to be looking for video examples of TPAC, TIM, and UDL. I'll say this again. If you can find one that covers all three, well, good on you. I want to see it. But if you want to look at one and say, here's a good example of a teacher who is incorporating technology uh, as she moves from different pedagogies to content, there's your TPAC one. If you want to take one and say, here's a teacher whose content is strictly one pedagogy and no technology, go for it. When you look at Tim, I think you see Tim now how it works. So we're looking at, is technology integrated? Uh, does it actually form a part of what's going on in the classroom or is it just, maybe it's not even there. And then UDL, do people who may need to have a different path in have an opportunity to have that path in. Let's go look at some of the videos and then we'll look at how to use. Uh, I told you last week that uh, there's a TPAC video here. I hope you watch that little short one right there. It does a really good job. Um, and then the Tim, we have a thing here in Tim. If you want to see a little bit about Tim and how it works. And then we have the technology in the classroom videos. I think, you know, there are enough of them here that you've got a pretty good um, look at the different ways. So let's jump down. And let's look at this one real fast. Teaching math with iPads. Let's see what this guy is up to. Now, right away, we see that this is kind of a canned presentation. But if you stay with it, he'll start talking. So let me go ahead and I'll move us through the slide. And he's doing all these different ways of showing the different tools. Well, he did talk at one time. I guess they've changed it. So, But you can see that he's using all kinds of different tools here to help teach math. I don't know about that. Um, let me give you, a, I really didn't know that they had changed that to where it's the music or the voice is gone. Let me show you another one that really does show you. So let's go up here and look at this one. What we're doing is we're allowing students to take measurements from images and videos, and we're enabling students to be scientists. They can quickly take measurements, and then they can perform analysis and see the physical relationships in the scientific phenomena. Okay. So we're doing something pretty complicated there, but it looked like we were given opportunities to use other tools. Let's look at this one. We saw a graph in our social book, it was a line graph, and when I asked the students uh, if they could read the graph, several of them had a lot of trouble reading it because of the lines. They were in between numbers, and they weren't sure what those numbers meant. I had the students create their own graphs using the exact same values for the exact same time frame uh, in a format that was uh, more meaningful for them. We, uh, we recreated the line graph again. We created a bar graph that was vertical, another bar graph. What do you think? Is that a UDL? It certainly is a TIM. Uh, and it certainly is a TPAC. I look at this one and I smile because I think it's a really good example of UDL. Well, let's, let me go ahead and show you then. Let's, let's jump to the, to the whole thing. So if I find a video that I'm going to use and I need three or one that does all three or two that does two and one that does one, you get the idea. 
I'm going to copy that video URL just by right clicking on it in the wiki here. And then I'm going to go to the blend space right there. And I'm going to log in using that magic Steve Swan, you know, username and password, that SBSwan02 at louisville.edu with the password of ULIT, all lowercase, ULIT241, all one word, ULIT241. And when I do log in, I'm going to look to create a new lesson right over here. And the first thing I want to do before I do anything else is I want to give it a title. Okay. If I do that, that sort of turns on the blend space to know that I want to save this thing that I have created. Now, to get my video in, it's really simple. I come over here to the icon that looks like YouTube. And then I'm going to come up here, and I'm now going to paste in that URL that I just was watching. And I now have the video. Drag it over here and drop it into my space. Right below it, I now have the ability to write. Now I'll go on and explain my reasoning. And then I'll close that. And there it is. So I have this. Now, what do I do with this? Now that I've got it named up here, I can go share it. And as you can see, uh, if you wanted to use this, by the way, you could use this uh, by creating your own class up, you know, in here. And you could send kids to this thing because you can create usernames and passwords for them. You would use my username and password as the admin. And you come in and create the class. And then you can create the kids' names and passwords so they can get in. Looky, looky down here. I just want to show you that real fast. So I could create something in blend space if I were a student. And I could put it right into the Google Classroom. Just want you to see that. For our purposes, all I'm going to do is come up here to where it says lesson link. And I'm going to highlight the lesson link. And I'm going to copy that. I now can go down here into our Padlet for this section, now this module. I can double click on it, click on the link, paste that link in there, and I can save it. When I do that, I didn't get the whole link. Let's go back and get that whole link, Stevie. When I do that, what I then get is it will come in. It will come in and it will be a part of my little um, My Padlet entry. Now, sometimes, well, I'm having trouble here. I don't know why it's giving me grief. Let me jump back into my TES. And we will go to the worst, you know, the worst thing or the, the easiest way to do it, frankly, would be to come up here and just click on this and copy that and then come over to here and come into the link and paste that in. And it will come in that way. Uh, I'm not sure why it's fighting me when I come here to share and I go to share.
I may have to do it by the embed. No, I don't think so, because that's not an embeddable code thing back there. Make sure everyone can see it. Share. I, I really am kind of at a loss here, gang, why it won't let me uh, do that. That's okay, because it came in this way. So it's here. And then, of course, I'm going to title it with my name, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Now, we've got Heathers over here. She's already got it done. And if I click on Heathers, and what it's going to do is it's going to bring me back to the blend space and I can see it. Now, the other thing, of course, that we talked about earlier is, again, you are taking that code... And you are putting it in to your live tech space. I'm really curious about what's going on here. So let me go ahead and put this in and see if it's going to let us do it. I am kind of at a loss as to why that's not doing that. Well, while I'm, I'm waiting to see if that shows up, I'll show you what it looks like in Google Classroom. So when you click on the Google Classroom link, it pops up and it says, I'm loading your Google Classrooms. You go in and you decide which Google Classroom you want to put it in. You click and it shows up in that Google Classroom. Well, now that would be you'd have to register it. I guess the easiest way to do it is to come in and just highlight this URL up here at the top and put it in. Because see, it's still not doing it. It doesn't like that. Well, that's okay. That's fine with us because all we're going to do is just go back to our Blend space. We're going to copy our URL from the very top up here. And we're going to put that in to make it work. Because we know it does. We'll put the link in here. And we will paste that link in. And we will save it. And boom. There it is. Now, let's close out by understanding where we are. We've done two modules. The first module was where we basically took a look at all the different ways and understandings that Michael Fullen talks to us about technology integration in education. And... The thing that, that we looked at were all of the difficulties and all of the different things that are distractions, uh, that are difficulties with technology integration in chapters two and three. We asked you then to do the same thing for chapters four and five using uh, infographic from pick to chart and here they all are and as i showed you tonight all you're doing for the live text is going in and opening up either your infographic from here that will take you back to its original source or go back to info in go back to pick chart log in find your infographic there and get the url either way and then you're putting that into the live text so for module one, you'll have two links that you'll be pasting in there that represent where your two different infographics live. For this one, module two, we are using the blend space. We are finding the three different videos that demonstrate our, we think, demonstrate TPAC either 
really demonstrate it or really don't demonstrate it. But make sure if you do a negative, you explain to me why it's a negative. Um, UDL and TIN. I think TIM and UDL are pretty easy to spot when you watch these. And then you're going to take that blend space, Earl. You're going to put it into our gallery walk. And then you're going to put that into our live text. You know, I've had people say to me, why are you making us do this gallery walk stuff? You're going to be grading it when it ends up in the live text. I'm modeling what I preach, okay? One of the things that we need to understand is, yes, we're using these tools as a part of this class, but I'm also demonstrating these tools for you to use in your class. Now, next week, which is the 21st, um, we won't be meeting. So the expectation will be that by the time I see you again on the 28th, you will have done modules one and two, and you will have them uh, located in the gallery walk and located in the live text. If you are having issues with live text, if you don't have a live text account, you need to let me know now so we can have a conversation. Um, and you know how to do that by now. You're going to text me at 502-457-2937. Um, Heather has texted me a couple of times. Thank you, Heather. I really appreciate you. Um, and it's that kind of communication that is wide open for you. Because that's a whole part of that UDL idea, isn't it? That we have this kind of open flow of communication that you don't have to worry about asking anything. Um, last thoughts. Happy Valentine's Day. I hope uh, you're out and doing something for Valentine's. Uh, I took my wife to Jeff Ruby's Steakhouse last night. We both ended up eating seafood because it was too expensive to eat anything else. But I have to say it was really good. Uh, and as I said, you've got plenty of time, since we're not meeting next week, to get yourself caught up. Now, when I see you on the 28th, what we'll be doing is we will be taking a total nosedive into Google Classroom. Now, if you have a Google Classroom, we're going to have to talk about how we can uh, do demonstrations of what you're doing in that classroom. By that, I mean, if you're inside a school and you're using Google Classroom inside the school, you're still going to be able to do the things that I'm going to show you next week. Um, or you can create a whole new Google Classroom on your own that, you know, it's your sandbox where you can play with things. If you're in a Google Classroom in a school, um, I can't see it. Okay, I've, I've, I've asked my friends at, at State Department, at the Governor's Office of Technology. Um, I've asked the folks here in JCPS. And everyone pretty much says the same thing. If you're not a part of the domain, you can't be in it. Well, I can't be a part of the domain because I'm not an employee. So what we will do for those of you is we'll talk about using screenshots. And then you can just upload them as attachments into um, that module for the Google Classroom. Okay, thank you all. Um, I think what I'm seeing is excellent work in the gallery walks that we've had so far. I hope we're going at a pace that uh, isn't too strenuous. And I hope these videos are doing what I always want them to do, which is they're a little bit slower in pace uh, and they cover the same material. But I feel like when I do them this way, you have a deeper understanding of what's going on. So once again, I thank you. Uh, I will get this posted as fast as I can, depending upon how long it went. It's gone for an hour and a half. And then I will see you on the 28th of February.